E. Elliott, Phil Slankowski, and I'm Jerry Sampson. I would like to mention again, as I mentioned previously, that if you are having any problems with the presentation, please be aware that the further you are from your router, if you're uh, on Wi-Fi, uh, the more the quality of the presentation will stumble, you'll get pixelated and our voices will fade in and out. Uh, we've done everything we can on our side to make certain that you're receiving a high quality presentation. Um, if you'd like to take a screenshot of this for any questions, comments, or in some cases, smart remarks, <laughs> uh, you can see Martha Ann Keels, uh, Bobby Elliott, Pediatric Dental Directions, Phil Slankowski, also Pediatric Dental Directions, and there is my email. Um, my education company is Nathos Incorporated. Some of you have asked about forms that I've been sending out. Uh, many of those forms are courtesy of Larry Gerald, who's an attorney, dentist, orthodontist. Um, George Gutierrez also uh, forwarded some very, very good material. And I'm happy and have permission to send that to everyone, but you do need to contact me at my email address for me to send that to you. Our next presentation is a week from today. Of course, these things are all being recorded for your viewing pleasure on YouTube. And um, those will be on YouTube at your disposal. Our next presentation is Tuesday, April 28th, a week from today uh, at noon Eastern time. And we're gonna focus on business decisions in a bit of a town hall format. Those business decision experts that are, have been invited are Michael Schwartz, Chief Executor, Executive Officer of Specialty Dental Brands, a substantial organization uh, focusing on pediatric dentistry. Orthodontics, uh, there is a small endo component as well as a small surgery, uh, oral surgery component. And uh, Michael will focus on things from the dental service organization corporate dentistry standpoint. Uh, most everyone who's a pediatric dentist will recognize former president of the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, Rob Della Rosa. Rob is in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, is, and has consented to be on the program a week from today. Uh, Rob has always impressed all of us who know him with his remarkable business ability, his ethics, as well as his, his willingness to explain exactly why he has done what he has done, and he's very, very transparent about mistakes that he's made. You may hear him say, oh, uh, I've done that. I'll never do that again. Also consenting to be on the program is one of the leading people in uh, the United States in risk management and informed consent. Larry Gerald is dual trained as an orthodontist. He's also a lawyer, and I believe Larry has a degree in ethics. Uh, in the humanities as well. He writes the litigation column every month in the American Journal of Orthodontics, uh, a highly unique individual, a close personal friend, and he'll be joining the panel of the usual suspects. Today's presentation, as you know, will focus uh, and center around what Martha Ann Keels has to say. That's it, baby. <laughs> High school. That's enough. Now uh, I'm going to stop my screen sharing and um, we're going to switch to uh, Martha Ann's presentation. Martha Ann? All right, you have it? Looks like you're up. So I'm gonna jump in real fast um, before Martha Ann takes off. We had some audio difficulties um, mm -hmm. when we were on last time on this portion about what not to say to the team. So we wanted to just quickly review that so that you had that audio piece. Um, as important of the things to say to the team, it's as important to consider what not to say. Um, the first one is you never wanna tell anybody to calm down and we certainly don't want to um, minimize the situation by saying that there's nothing to worry about. Um, 
it's also important to not discuss death rates or other negative figures. Um, we did talk about why it's important to acknowledge their fear, but at the same time, we want to try to keep everything as positive as possible. Um, it's super important to stay humble through this process as well. You don't want to discuss how this has negatively affected either your personal finances, your vacations, or, or any missed trips that you may have. That is, this is not the time to, to share that with your team. They're going through their own struggles. Um, it's also important not to discuss any behind the scenes business discussions. Um, however much we're, we're paying on our rent, and even though we've got no cash flow coming in, that is not their issue to worry about. Um, try to keep everything as positive as you can. And finally, we just don't know when we're going back. Um, this is going to be individual for each state based on each governor's decision. But at this point, we just don't have a date. So we are not giving them any type of uh, false hope or date um, until we have uh, more information. I think uh, what I'd like to jump in on that one is you have to give people some idea about this and saying, we don't know, don't know um, that, le that leaves us as frustrated as um, everybody. So I think that the underscoring um, that you would want to hear if you were the parent or you were an adult patient, because uh, we have general dental specialists online as well, is um, safety first, safety always. Once we are confident that we know exactly what the safest thing to do is from the Centers for Disease Control, from the government, we will move forward, but not until we're certain that everyone will be safe. And uh, I think that does give them an answer, even though it's not a start date. And with that, Martha Ann. All righty. So this time, this part three, we wanted to focus on our patients, but I first wanted to kind of revert back to our recommendation if you do get a chance to do the happiness course with the professor at Yale, Laura Santos. But one of the things that gives you happiness for a longer time, like over 60 days, is doing something grateful for someone else. And I'd highly recommend, even if you were fortunate to get your PPP funded or your IDLE funded, if for those who didn't, is this is the day to call, email um, your senators or representatives, and you can email Speaker of the House. If you're not from California, just Google Speaker of the House and you can email her directly because they're coming back to, to DC on Wednesday now to vote on this. They've hit a stumbling block. So we need to be blowing up their phones um, saying to provide critical care. Um, that what we do is provide critical care for children in the United States. So everyone jump on that today. So I broke it down into kind of six steps of how I kind of organized um, the strategy of dealing with COVID-19. And then a few people have asked if I would just give my um, soap, my standard operating procedure for right at this moment for how we're dealing with emergency care. So the first one was just the closed down communication process. So hopefully we've all done this, but I'm just putting it up there because if we have a resurgence, then we're gonna be going back to step one again. So, and then you'll be getting the slide deck so you, you don't have to like write anything down. Um, it's one just immediately, if we've got to shut down again, stop your appointment reminders, whether that's Lighthouse, whatever system you use, and then start an electronic communication to all your patients. So we let our patients know that we will be communicating with them every Monday for the first four weeks and then on an as needed basis. So the first letter went out was just how we're gonna screen you for COVID-19. That's your travel, your fever, any close contacts. Um, and then the hygiene protocol for the practice, which at that point, this was before we got the shutdown was you know washing your hands with the sanitizer before and leaving the practice. The second letter that went out on the second Monday was telling our practice that we were in compliance on March 16th with our governor's orders in the ADA that we needed to close down except for emergency and urgent care. The third reminder was telling them that we were open, um, that we were open for teledentistry and that we were open for emergencies and trauma and that we would be screening them and, and getting up with them. And then also constantly reminding them that we would be calling them to reschedule their appointment, that they didn't need to worry about that. The fourth one, was because we do do some orthodontic care. There's quad helixes, phase one, some phase two. We needed to get the reminders out to orthodontic patients about keeping their teeth clean, about how to wear their rubber bands, how to wear their headgear, 
And then we would be calling them individually to follow up on questions and the Invisalign cases, what we were doing. Letter five is currently on hold and that's being built at the moment is to finalize our office standard operating procedure for how we're gonna handle um, when you come in for elective care. And we're still waiting sort of to hear what our rule makers are gonna tell us we have to do. Um, and then we are continuing to send statements and it's also giving the opportunity for the families to contact back to us to ask for the pause. No different than many of us have asked for pause on rent or pause on paying your dental suppliers. Um, so far, we've only out of um, close to 10,000 patients, only had a handful ask for pause and payment. And certainly, we are pausing for payment. Um, and on all of those letters, just an FYI, um, we say, you know, if you don't want to see these letters, please let us know and we'll take you off the letter receiving list, which is a letter going electronically, not snail mail. No one has asked us to stop sending them a letter. Let me, uh, let me ask a question about that if on, on step one closing down communications, could, could you give me a little bit of repeat or clarification on that and maybe some, uh, any questions or comments from Bobby or Phil? When you say close down communications. Uh, well, that was just meaning that the communications that needed to happen when I knew we were headed into a close down, as well as what happened the minute we got closed down. So that letter one was, you know, based on my, based on what was happening in the Durham and Duke University community that people were being communicated to, this was before we got shut down of saying, you know, we, we're gonna be screening you if you've had any COVID exposure and we're going to institute some hand hygiene protocol. And then we propped open all the doors coming into the practice so no one was touching any door handles. So you would come in and hand sanitize. And this was before, I mean, this is when we could use our waiting room. And then, you know, letter two is going out as when we got the mandate that we had to close our doors except for emergency care. And you say these are all being sent out electronically, is that right? I use Lighthouse, but um, you, whatever system you have that you're able to upload a letter and boom, on your letterhead, it goes out to your entire patient population. And Phil, Jerry, Jerry, to reference what your question was also, you want to make sure that you shut down communication, meaning appointment reminders. You don't want the letter to go out that says we're closed and then they get an appointment reminder that says, by the way, you have an appointment on April 13th. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, not cool. Phil, do you have anything uh, on that step one point? No, that's, I think, um, I think all of us have pretty much had to address that one way or another. Um, uh, when Martha Ann mentioned you'll be receiving a slide deck, uh, if you, uh, I've sent out Bobby and Phil did a absolutely first class job of a synopsis of their presentation, uh, bullet points, and even a few comments. And I've sent that to all the people whose emails that I have. Um, you can contact me directly. You can contact any of us to get those notes because they're quite, they're quite useful. Um, one of the other things I'll underscore about this is that you need to bear in mind that uh, when people, when your patients and the families are getting this information, that once probably isn't enough. Um, you know yourself that you've got all kinds of things swirling around in your mind. And a, um, rep, a bit of repetition is really a good thing. It, it shows that you're actually concerned enough that they understand. And um, I think Martha Ann mentioned this, but I'll underscore the idea that um, these people need to understand, need really to understand they can contact you as necessary um, with some mobile phone numbers. And uh, I, I think the, the new mode of customer service uh, is gonna be an application of things that you may have heard before. For example, are you willing to give people your mobile number? Are you willing to actually give that out? Or an associate's mobile number? Who's on call? Are you willing to do that? Because those people that are not willing to do it uh, really are not gonna prevail. It, this is a whole amplified level of customer service. And making sure that these people understand that in anything that they receive um, by email, which I think is fine, uh, 
I think that there should be a number for them to call with any questions or concerns. Any comment from the other three people? So we've done that. Um, they know how to reach us and probably to amplify letter number three was, um, I didn't type it there, but we also included that we are, you can call and schedule a te teledentistry appointment and probably there will be another letter, probably a letter six, where I refine that of what that's going to be. Um, you know, because I think teledentistry will be part of our culture going forward um, is, and I'm constantly fine tuning that process of, you know, how yeah, you write. I'll, I'll be able to put those up on IP though. I'll post all three of our um, post synopsis notes um, when I post this video along with the other two. There have been um, some wild things that have happened in the orthodontic community uh, from the American Association of Orthodontists Insurance Company, AAOIC, came out with a consent letter for visiting the office, not a virtual visit, an actual orthodontic visit that um, the membership by and large, I'm staying neutral on this, so let's not make the mistake of saying, of thinking that you know what I think because I'm not going to burden you with that. But the, uh, the majority of people that were uh, vocal about this on the social media were really offended by how aggressive uh, this, this first letter was. Now they've modified it. They've softened it up a great deal this is for an orthodontic patient coming to the office that it, the first letter sounded like, well, you are taking responsibility and you know full well that if you walk into this office, um, you could die from any uh, disease known to humankind and even those that haven't been found out yet. Yeah, you can, you can all like me. So now they've softened that up a great deal. But I, I don't know, and I'm pleading ignorance on this, if the Academy or the ADA has come out with anything like that. Uh, Martha Ann, do you have a comment about that? Well, I think that, I mean, I'm keeping my eye on the American Academy of Pediatrics and our local state pediatric society has sort of instituted a plan a of tele telehealth A and a telehealth B. And a telehealth A is um, kind of a lot what we're doing right now is talk, giving a critical advice but at the end of it saying, you know, I feel like I don't need to see you. I don't need to physically see you to solve this problem. And then part B, so there's two different billings for part A and a billing for part B. And part B is at the end of A, you say, given all the information that I've gleaned from you, I really need to see your child to sort this out. Um, so I think it's morphing, it's evolving as, as now so many people are doing telehealth. Um, so I think it's totally evolving and I think I would recommend um, starting to do it and just, um, and I'm certainly can share, I listened to all the te different teledentistry, the ADA one and a couple others and we formatted our chart note so that it's got all the legal part and then I'll listen to Dr. Gerald and see what else I've probably forgotten. But I think this is a work in progress like so many of the other things we're doing right now is it's morphing um, as we speak. There's a question uh, that I see that's quite interesting. Uh, uh, what do you do when a parent has a dental concern for their child but says they are going to refuse to pay for an exam via teledentistry? Um, now, you know, I, I don't really want to pull, put that off until next Tuesday when Larry Gerald's on the panel, uh, but I think it's an important enough question that if if anyone on the panelists have a comment to make about that, um, I'd like you to do so. Uh, Bobby, what would you say to that? I think I'd follow up with what Dan um, also posted is that most insurance companies right now are understanding the situation and are reimbursing for telehealth visits. Phil? I think any situation like that, you as the provider are going to offer what services you provide. I mean, they can always find another provider if that's the way they're going to be. It's, you know, I, I think that's where you still have the matter of a, of a choice on behalf of the parent. I mean, you know, insurances are coming along a lot quicker on this tele on the telehealth front. I mean, there were a lot of barriers in the past to this that they've closed down. I think it's going to be interesting to see how this does continue to involve evolve. Um, but I don't feel as if anybody should ever feel pressured by a parent to do something they're not comfortable with. Yeah, I'll second that. Uh, Dr. Miski, just if you're looking at the text, she just said the ADA does have some coding for this. 
um, she's on the inside track of that as well. Um, I do think that what Phil said is important to realize, uh, Larry Gerald will be emphasizing things like this, that you are in fact establishing a doctor-patient relationship, whether it's any type of teledentistry. If a, if a kid is hit in the mouth it just that it, before COVID and um, they email you a picture um, or they ask your opinion at the ball field, they're not a patient of record, you need to be aware that you have now established a formal doctor-patient relationship. And what Phil said is really important is uh, don't ever do something that you're uncomfortable with. Um, Larry Gerald will tell you that loud and clear. He's certainly mentioned that in other seminars. If you are uncomfortable with what the parent's asking you to do, the answer is pretty straightforward. I understand uh, what you are saying and he's your child, therefore your wishes will be respected. But what you're asking me to do, I'm really not quite comfortable with. So let me recommend that you get some other opinions or seek care from someone else. Now, I don't, I don't wanna get mired down in this. So Martha Ann, would you uh, rave on please? Sure. So step two was um, revisiting my um, social media communications. And this is where I think pulling in your team and having sort of some fun and positive connections with your patients and using, um, we use Instagram and Facebook and our website, but we've done a couple of videos um, that demonstrate that we're vital and healthy. And we were careful, well, we're broken, there are 18 of us in our practice, so there's three doctors, three, three secretaries, three OR assistants, three of this and three of that. So we're broken into teams of six. So we were really careful in social distancing and our uh, initial videos, but um, you know, giving Good. messages about um, so um, physical distancing, taking care of your teeth, and then we did um, collages um, with messages with the entire team. So it gives the um, appearance that we're all still together. So the collages, if you go on my Instagram. Duke Street Smiles, you'll see a collage of all 18 with music attached um, saying um, it's the happy song. And I think we should all just copy each other. We're in different parts of the country. If someone comes up with a great idea, I'm fine if you I mean, take any of my ideas and it helps you. I mean, that's what this is all about. Um, or even if you're in my neighborhood, I'm fine. Just if it makes you happy, use it. Bobby, um, um, could you are you doing something similar? Can we, because I think this is a big, big issue to stay in contact um, and that uh, for the entire team. I like this collage idea. Bobby, do you have something along those lines? Sure. To underscore your point, um, connection and communication with your team is vital during this time, especially with no end in sight. Um, to echo what Martha Ann said, fun things that your patients can see that are thoughtful, that took time to put together, sends a huge message to a relationship-based practice. Um, a couple of other suggestions. We, with communication with our team, we have a closed Facebook team page that we post on throughout the week. It's a great one spot location, central location for communication. Um, I personally try to put up two to three positive messages and personal posts to the team each week. Um, another thing to do is just to make sure that the doctors consider doing a video message to your patients. Um, in addition to the wonderful fun collages and pictures that you put up, I think they need to hear, the patients need to hear from the doctors that one, we are coming back, two, we are healthy, our team is, is all healthy and are ready to come back whenever we get the green light. And just make that a fun, positive, short message, but that's been very well received from our, from our patients. And uh, underscoring again, safety is our main, main concern. I mean, you don't have to beat it to death, but I think that's what people need to understand. I think, of course, with uh, my predilections, I like the idea of music, but instead of uh, the happy song, mine would probably be Stairway to Heaven or uh, Purple Haze. Phil, do you have, <laughs> any, uh, you have anything? <laughs> do you have anything, Phil? I think I'll just echo what... Bobby was saying and just kind of underline that, you know, during this time we have to recognize that this is this is just as much a psychological game that as much as a PR game. And that what we have to do is recognize where people are in their heads and that by reaching out and, and doing these posts and and as a doctor reaching out to your patients, look, 
there's people out there thinking that I don't need to do that. And the question you have to, you have to ask yourself is this is one of those situations where like, well, well, what's the, what's the trade-off? I mean, if, you know, when, if, when, you know, we have to recognize that the economy we're coming back to is not going to be the same economy. So anything that we can do to maintain connection with our patients is going to motivate them even more so to want to come back and see us versus looking for someone else that they might need to establish a new relationship with in a time where uncertainty is prevailing. So, you know, I think as a human, just connecting with my patients in a way like that is important. But I think if you want to put your business hat on, anything you can do to connect and stay connect in a way that's not overwhelming them because everyone's on information overload in a way that can reach to the psychology is going to increase your potential patient retention. And I know like it's tough to talk about that right now, but you know, all of us are in different places right now with our businesses and all of us are worried about different things. So I think that the most important thing is the reason we're advocating to get out and get in touch with your patients is because it's the right thing for us to do as healthcare providers. And we need to make sure that as they know that they're going to come back into our offices, that just simply, if you do nothing but come across as being compassionate and emphasizing safety, like that's all you need to do. Don't write some, you know, big, don't think you have to go out there and make some big profound statement. Just say, we miss you. We miss you being here. And we're doing everything we can to make this a safe environment for you. And underlying the fact that you're healthy and your team healthy is going to put, is going to alleviate a lot of their fears. So I think for people that are kind of overwhelmed with what they can do, just do something that simple. And if a video is too much for you, then just make a written statement. Do something that projects that from your office. Very well said. Martha. One additional comment, um, Jerry, on that. Don't forget that if your team members have birthdays or office anniversaries during this break, don't overlook those opportunities. Flowers can still be delivered. We have two team members that have anniversaries, office anniversaries. And so it's, an, it's not only important to stay connected to them by saying happy anniversary or happy birthday, but that's another opportunity to post on your Facebook page and your web page that you guys are still connected and having fun. Yes. And tomorrow's and, Admin Appreciation Day. Don't forget to contact your admin people. Right. And um, we have, in our practice, lost some loved ones due to COVID-19 um, in our patient families. And just be, um, sadly, um, I've, we've, been, we've already sent out a couple of sympathy cards. Um, so just to be ahead of that. And then on a positive note, posting some fun tips for um, parents um, how to entertain their kids at home. And then I went to move to step three, which is really the focus of the rest of the steps is really safeties first. Um, but three principles, I recently read an article in the Harvard Business um, Magazine, Review Magazine about how to survive a crucible moment. And three driving principles are empathy, listening to the concerns of your staff, your patients, um, but being have an adaptive um, capacity and what that means is being flexible and being, being willing to pivot as the rule makers are changing the rules um, and staying positive because in the future, we will be looking back and saying like, why weren't we doing this before? Just like gloves during the HIV um, epidemic. Many of us, I was still in dental school at that time. Um, we weren't wearing gloves except for surgery. And now I ask myself like, wow, I would never do that without wearing gloves. So this will be one of those moments where we're gonna look back in a few years and go, yeah, we should have been doing that all along. I think um, I, I want to underscore uh, what Martha Ann just said. Those people, they can adapt, that maintain a positive attitude. I'm not, not this rose-colored glasses stuff. They, people who maintain a positive attitude towards adapting as all the rules keep changing instead of throwing their wigs in the air and spitting up and getting frustrated and letting the team see that, or even worse, letting the parents see that, those people are not, they're just not gonna survive. They're, they're certainly not going to prevail. Now is the time to make up your mind about who you're going to be. And you need to be that person that is going to adapt and do what needs to be done, or you're not gonna survive. Martha Ann? So um, if this is survival in the face of a virus that's in the background all the time. And we just have to remember that. So part step three was appointment planning. And I think you ought to start thinking about, or at least I'm thinking about plan A, B, and C. 
I don't know which one I'm going to fire on, but the moment the plan that's kind of rising to the top for me is to still maintain the team structure, but collapses down from three teams to two teams of where we have the 7 to 1 a.m., the 1 p.m. block, a 30-minute really super clean, everything in office, and then start up again. Maybe it's 2 to 8 or 1.30 to 7.30 and alternate team A and TV in terms of one week in the morning, next week here in the afternoon, and then alternate who works Saturdays. Um, and, and the reason for that is if there's someone in one of those teams gets sick, you you know, depending on what the guidelines are going to be, that team could have to step out for seven days if they don't have any symptoms. Um, and you still got another team that could then fall back into working full time. And that's I'm also following what Duke is doing. The other thing is to keep in mind in your own office to go ahead and start to measure how far apart your chairs are. So what we don't know yet is are we going to fall under six feet distancing physical distancing or 13 feet, because some of the research coming out, it's a four meter spread, that's 13 feet. So thinking about, I do have three open bays, I do have quiet rooms, is how I'm grouping families, um, thinking about, am I gonna need the temporary partitions, which restaurants are looking at? Restaurants are looking at potentially um, dropping from the ceiling a clear plastic shield between tables so kind of keep your eye out. Am I pulling the trigger to buy stuff? I'll tell you later on what I'm pulling the trigger to buy. I'm, these are things to tell you what I'm common sense thinking about of, of coming into play with physical distancing. And then also scripting the staff on appointment scheduling process because we're going to be changing up depending on what rules come down as to how we're going to have to run our schedules and having them be flexible and moving as much of the paperwork as possible, which we probably were 80% electronic there. There was still some paperwork happening, but updates, everything as much as we can electronic so they're not coming in having to touch paper or um, be handed a piece of paper. And then um, the staff that's handling all these appointment rescheduling is to, um, they're gonna have to listen because they're gonna say, how are you doing? Great to talk to you. We just wanna you know, reschedule your appointment. There will be some sad stories so that's where you just need to remember the advice that um, the tribal elder always gives us is to, we hope for the very best for you and your family. Um, Cause that, that is the best that we can do, but you know, script that. So I've actually written that down at the front desk so they can see it and they, and they don't have to remember, like it's there written down. It's sort of like the same sheet of paper that Bobby all taught us to put on the phone. Like if it's a 911, you know, how to call 911, like, I have that on all the phones if we ever had an emergency. I'm now putting some of these um, standard operating procedures written down so they can see them. So the first in step four is measures inside the office with safety being paramount. So a common sense thing is, I know some of you already have offices where you have the window, but some don't. So buying one of those sneeze or cough barriers that are feet, three feet high and roughly three feet wide, maybe. I mean, I measured mine. I have three front desk stations. That, that makes sense to me too. So if someone's coming up to the desk, you're avoiding a droplet spread on your front desk. People in mine are, are sitting down at computers. So the sneeze or the cough isn't coming right into their face. So um, that seems common sense to me. And that's a low budget item to think about. You can find that on uh, Amazon. These are cough barriers. They're on Amazon. Uh, you can see quite a few of those. You're probably seeing them at the grocery store and things like that. But um, I uh, want to echo that that's important to do now because you're going to have emergencies coming in and you want these people to see that you're already ahead of the game on that because they're seeing it at other, at other uh, facilities like the grocery store, et cetera. And depending on what kind of credit card swiper you have is a standing operating procedure for how you're going to cover that and disinfect it. Um, you know, repositioning your waiting room chairs, like we may not be able to use our waiting room chairs, but if you could space them so they're six feet apart, um, you know, still those games probably aren't going to be played on and no magazines, no touchy things. Um, and then a thing that I put star is there is good science for the UV lights, the UVC lights, and potentially thinking about having those at night. Um, I mean, those are turned on in many operating rooms around the United States at night. 
um, and they do kill um, bacteria and virus and the coronavirus. So I did a lit review, and that seems to make some that seems to make some sense as to um, potentially look at having those lights. But I would potentially look, wait and see um, what's going to come down. But that one, that's m making sense to me. And then you know the phase. Most of our governors, I think, are saying there's a phase one, phase two, and phase three, ramping up slowly, opening things up. I was super disappointed to hear in the state of Georgia, they're opening up nail salons, beauty salons, um, but not dentistry or vets. They were moved down into one of the later phases. So our governors are going to make some, I think, unfortunate decisions, because I think we could demonstrate that we've practiced infection control policies for a long time. And for us to tweak ourselves a little bit, I think we can handle that. Um, let's um, let's let's just uh, um, sidebar on that just for a minute about opening up and um, about when you're actually going to see patients. Now, I will tell you that some of the feedback that I've received from various sources around the country is um, there is a feeling among some to wait at least ten days to two weeks once. The governance of each state or the state you're in says it's okay to start seeing dental patients. There is a feeling among some people that uh, they're not going to do it. They do not want to be the canary that's being lowered into the mine shaft and find out that maybe what's going to happen is what happened in Singapore, which I think everybody knows about or should know about. They opened up too soon. It's just a mess what's going on in that country uh, from opening up too soon. So I think you really have to think about this safety first, safety always, as to when you're going to open up or whether you're going to lay back. Martha Ann? So moving um, to the clinic, still part of step four, which is the safety measures in our office, is um, I think this is a truly rate limiting step, is if it's going to be required for us to wear N95s or KN95, where the K stands for Korea, um, getting a hold of those is a challenge. Um, I think face shields, um, hair coverings, we're kind of strategizing that we may go the route of um, our staff having different scrub hats for different days of the week, and then we would wash them at the end of the day. Um, uh, certainly, if you're wearing an N95 mask or K95, no jewelry and no makeup. Um, that's why I wrote yikes. Um, but you, we can't wear makeup now at Duke uh, with an N95 because it'll contaminate it. Um, disposable gowns and then shoe coverings, whether you want to go with the booties or dedicated work shoes. We're leaning towards having dedicated work shoes only, that these are shoes just worn in the office but still will be disinfected. But really, we need more science and more guidance as to when we clean this stuff, when we toss it, and when we replace it. And that's still, still being sorted out. So I can just tell you, Duke was the university that came up with the sterilization technique for the 95 mask, which is vaporized hydrogen peroxide, which is a ginormous sterilizer that they, as long they're taking our N95 mask at the end of the day, and going, so this is when I'm in the hospital, and they go and we sterilize them in the hopper, and then whatever, whichever one I turn in is not going to be the one I'm going to get if I go back into the hospital for an emergency. So um, can we afford one of those in our offices? I'm not sure uh, um, if they're going to make one small enough, um, but just be real careful that there's a lot of black market. A lot of your dental supply companies are trying to push selling different things to do different things. I would hold off on spending any money. I'll certainly share with you when I feel like it makes sense to spend money. Um, but right now it's trying to get a hold because I think, let's say you're allowed to reopen May 18th, but you don't have any N95 mask. Um, what does that mean? And I do think we have to be, you know, back to one of my principles of empathy. I think we need to listen to our staff saying they don't feel comfortable working unless we provide them with the proper um, um, coverage. And, you know, I will share, I do have pa two patient families where both parents and the children have all had this disease and it was not easy. I mean, they were out for, you know, a month um, of to recovering. So 
um, it is, it's, it's in the background and we just have to be mindful of that. I don't know um, if you guys want to add anything. Could, uh, yeah, gents, something. I just think we underscore that we don't know enough science yet to make rational decisions. We just have to wait. And, and make I, apologies for that. The team needs to understand how important it is that they are adaptable and don't show the frustration that everybody feels during the adaptive process. I think that's really important. You know yourself, if you go to any place, it doesn't matter what the place is for an experience. It could be a music hall, it could be a restaurant, it could be your physician's office. If you pick up that those people that are there, the team, is uh, not happy or frustrated or annoyed, you're not real crazy about coming back. And uh, think about how important that's going to be as we crawl back into the new normal. Phil, did you have something? <clears throat> the only thing I will add is that when have we in the course of our profession, nor within the course of our personal lives, seen so many decisions made with such weak data? I mean, the only thing we know right now is that there is a, there is a new virus that is affecting people. And at one point, they were telling us it was going to affect a lot more people and now are affect a lot more people in more severe states, but yet the numbers continue to change. And yet we're trying to project policy. You know, I'm, I'm kind of echoing what Bobby said, and that is we just don't know a lot. And I think it's, that's what's making this so hard for us is that we have an increasing patient burden. I'm, you know, like we have more and more patients that are in pain that are not being monitored and we still don't have any clear understanding or that the science we have is constantly changing. And I think that's very tough for us. So we kind of have to operate with the best that we know. And I think, what, I think what's tough for a lot of us is that we've had a certain, at least in dentistry, and I think that's a great example you shared about how in Georgia, they're opening up nail salons, but they won't let the dentists open up. I mean, how ridiculous is that? Anyway, I don't want to digress. Um, in dentistry, we have practiced a level of, of sterilization, of protecting our patients that I think we're just kind of, we're still, I think, trying to come up with rationalization for, for what are we going to do next? And does that then throw into question everything we've done before? And you have a large group out there that are like, well, wait, what we've done before has worked. What's really different about this virus? And we don't have that data. So there's, to me, there's a lot of unanswered questions. So I'm I definitely lean more toward the camp of, of patience and prudence is always going to prevail. However, I am starting to really struggle with the amount of emergencies that are mounting. And um, I don't have an answer for that. Well, I, yeah, it's the proverbial, these are questions in search of answers. But uh, I'm going to quadruple underscore, don't get mired up and, uh, and sidetracked by how annoying and how frustrating this is. Martha Ann, uh, during our preparation the other day for this presentation, uh, you addressed something that um, was, I think, an important point about uh, people who, once the testing is available, what's your take on testing for antibodies? And what do you know from uh, epidemiology and such at Duke? Well, I mean, um, they actually gave a great talk this morning on all three, like when, when realistically are we looking at a vaccine, probably 2021, um, when are we, real, the viral testing that, that we're having right now, like just to back up and say when I'm treating a child inside the hospital for emergency reasons, um, they're COVID testing them and if they're negative, then I'm using the tire that I used before COVID-19 broke out. So even the anesthesiologists were all just being normal for what normal used to be. Um, but that test is only considered good for seven days because that's the window of, of you know, COVID negative viral testing is only saying that your past experience, you're negative or, or it's negative because they didn't get that swab far up your nasal pharynx to, and it's saying negative, but we're still, that's how we're practicing. But the antibody test is at the moment, there's not a good one and there's a ton of false positives. Um, so, you know, when we're going to have that as well, I mean, they're all these scientists and all these major medical universities are working. I mean, um, one of the most famous one working on antibody tests, he was interviewed um, and he had, he's averaging about three hours of sleep a night as he's got his lab crunching, trying to figure this out. So, 
um, the look of the antibodies looking different based on you know whether it was whether you came the virus came across through Europe to the United States or whether it came across from China to to California into the United States. So there's a lot of variability in this antibody testing. So we're all anxious for it. It would be awesome to be able to say that um, I have antibodies, but also the answer to, to the question, let's say I'm antibody positive. Um, we don't have any science yet to say that that affords me immunity for my life. Does that mean I won't get reinfected? Um, you know, we don't have the answer to that question. Yeah, now there's, there's an important question the, for, for everybody in their family. Once the antibody test is, is available, um, I think what Martha Ann's comment is, and certainly uh, me and my wife didn't think about that at all, is all right, if we test uh, antibody positive, how much confidence does that give you? And Martha Ann, you're saying that needs to be questioned. Isn't that right? Yes. Yeah, I mean, we're racing, we're pushing science without measured follow-up and you know, a lot of these studies, you want several studies being done around the United States and around the world that we're coming up with the same answers before you go, yeah, that looks like, wow, this is affording great immunity. You're not gonna get reinfected. We don't know that. I mean, um, we, we've never made a vaccine to a coronavirus. And some people say, well, wow, we've done it with the flu, but the flu has been one that we've been making, the vaccines have been made to it, you know, many, many times that when a new variation comes out, they can easily adapt and make a new one. But this is not the case. And so a lot, you know, I think we're gonna be going into the world to practice knowing that this virus is in the background, no different than hepatitis C's in the background, all the herpes viruses are in the background, influenza is in the background, but we're just ramping it up. Why are we ramping up a notch? Because this virus is a lot more lethal and um, its infectivity is a lot greater than these other viruses. Um, okay. Martha, and this is, you know, I, I wanted to add one more thing to your comment because this is kind of where you and I, when we were discussing this yesterday, where we kind of found some agreement because um, I think it, you know, here's, here's how kind of I've kind of started framing it for my office because that, you know, there's a lot of deep science that all of us are taking deep dives on that we probably haven't had to, to think about since either uh, college or dental school, right? I mean, we've all been listening to webinars and, and, and listening to experts and talking to our peers about viruses and epidemiology, you know. <laughs> um, the, the new normal for us that I think we have to look at is that, I agree with you, this virus is in the background. Now, fortunately, I think we're seeing the data come back that more and more people were infected and not showing symptoms. So the original mortality of this is going down significantly. So that's good. But I think what we have to look at is that everything we're doing in our office is to decrease exposure to viral loads. And that, you know, just, you know, what I'm trying to help my team understand is that the things that we're going to do, the things that are smart and that we currently can do are things that we probably should have been doing in the past during a high influenza season. You know, because with all the people that do come in and out, and with us working in people's faces, we're, we are at most at risk for high viral loads. So we, we also wanna undermine that getting your own immune system is huge, but I think you know, the UV lights, like you said, you did a lit review on that and showed that the UV lights are huge for killing off those viruses. So anything we can do in our office to decrease virus loads is gonna help with everything, not just the coronavirus. So I think, I think looking at it from the perspective of, okay, what do we know? We know that people who are exposed to high viral loads with this particular virus, if they're predisposed to get it with, you know, if you look at the different um, is comorbidities that are high, like for example, like I think up in the Michigan area, you had high levels of diabetes with that patient population, not to mention the above 80 over in Italy, but you know, you're talking about compromised immune systems. So I think, I think helping your team understand that there is going to be a new normal, but that what we're trying to do is create a safe environment is key. But I think, um, yeah, I just wanted to, I guess, I guess echo what you were saying, Martha Ann, but I think helping our teams understand it from the standpoint of, we're just trying to decrease how much virus is out there in the environment. And that's going to be the best we can do. Well said, Martha Ann. Um, so I just say we need to just make sure we stay informed with the rulemakers. And I certainly will share 
you know, as I learn more from the ADA um, and other organizations about, you know, what we should do and how we should pivot. But, you know, in terms of some of the common sense things, like I'm thinking maybe I should make a table because down on low, low for me is um, negative pressure rooms. Maybe in the middle might make sense is a HEPA filter with the UV lights inside of them. Because definitely you don't want to be changing a filter and a HEPA filter where you don't have the UV light inside that unit. But I need diving into the science of that. There's still some question marks in, um, on that area. But I know, that, for instance, that Duke, Duke's gone from, well, maybe negative pressure help, maybe positive pressure. They've gone back and forth. Like the, the whole pressure thing's off because if you're ever in a negative pressure room, the minute you walk out, you're in a positive pressure room. So it makes sense, perhaps, if you were going to be in a hospital room for three months being treated for a stem cell transplant, that you're in a negative pressure room. But in our situation, you might be in there for 30 minutes, an hour. I don't know. The science behind that is very equivocal. So I put that on my low, low, low priority list. Um, but I do think that, you know, we need to be prepared to circle back to step one. If a re you, you see the phase that government is telling us that we're going to be phased in and at the minute they see a resurgent, they're going to shut us right back down. So we need to be able to pivot right back around. And together, we need to edit what worked, what didn't work for us as we went through this again. And I think in the background, I still hear the echoing of my accountant saying, you know, you need three months of cash on hand. And now I'm hearing some financial planners saying you need six months of cash on hand. So obviously, I've had a tremendous setback. But I think to all the young doctors out there, you should be principled to make that happen as quickly as possible going forward because we could be living in a world where this could happen on a maybe maybe not every hundred years but in your career maybe a couple times I mean who knows but I think that's a really smart lesson and then um, several of you asked what is my current standard operating procedure for emergency care and um, so one is obviously determining is this a real emergency um, uh, most of my teledentistry consults have been around eruption problems, um, which they don't need to come in for. Um, but also determining what their COVID-19 history is. And then reviewing with the parent the new protocol. What is the new protocol? That when they come to the parking lot, they call the front desk. And we, when we put in this email that we send them what the front desk number is so they don't have to stress over finding it, that we will inform them when it's time to come up and they will be bypassing the waiting room, coming straight into the operatory, all of our doors are propped open and only one adult, one adult with the child, um, everyone's wearing mask and if possible to brush their teeth before arriving, obviously if the child's in so much pain and cellulitis that may not be possible um, or comfortable for the child and then telling them that um, we will be wearing N95 mask, a face shield and gowns um, and then obviously the prize box, which is so important for the child, that we'll be showing them options and then won't let them touch, we'll be handing them one. So that's sort of the current, um, so for, for me handling emergencies and love feedback if you've added more or less, or obviously going forward if we, with the um, new guidelines from the ADA saying use your clinical judgment um, of, you know, I think if I am going to be using aerosols, then I think the the um, the scrub. I think we'll probably be moving next week to wearing scrub hats all the time and um, dedicated work shoes. And then I love this quote from Christopher Reeve. Um, he said, "A leader, is someone who, in spite of weakness, doubt, or not knowing the answers, go ahead and overcomes anything." And I think just going ahead and trying to be future focused and trying to solve these puzzles um, and looking for what makes sense, I think gives you a sense of control and very settling. Um, um, and then I just say, we can all be bold. We can do this. Well, um, go back our, that one up. Uh, Martha, and it was absolutely Martha. wonderful. Um, and to the rest of uh, the panelists, I certainly would like to thank you for your generosity. I also want to thank Griff Kirstein from Three Blue Trees. He's donated his time generously uh, for our efforts. We, found, we hope that you found your time with us as time worthwhile. And we'll see you next Tuesday. Everything.